If this is your first time here, you honor us by the decision you've made to come and join us. So thank you so very, very much for coming. I would love for you to take a communication card that's in the pew in front of you, if you would. Fill it out. Drop it in the offering bag when it comes by. And next week through the mail, we will give you information about the church, about the staff, about the services and the ways you can engage. We promise we will not beat on your door or bother you on the phone, but through the mail, give you information that we trust is very, very helpful. Um, there's a challenge for me this morning. Uh, if you were here last week, uh, you kind of knew what happened. Uh, we all got caught by surprise. Um, uh, I'm not going to take time to go through and explain it. I, I did that in the 8 o'clock service because as you know, last week I preached the regular sermon in the 8 o'clock and then we did something different the next two. So they're now up to speed on what transpired. But it was just one of those unique moments where um, God always shows up. God's here every Sunday. And I think what tri transpired last week is all of us agreed to let him show up. And so, um, in a nutshell, um, we had about almost 30 people in the 915 service come forward about some decision that they were making in their life. Some of them were, were to invite Christ in their life for the very first time. There were some others who were coming back from being away from God for a long time in their life. There were others who made important decisions. Um, uh, there have been two different couples, one at the end of the service and one in a letter I received this past week that said, what happened last Sunday saved our marriage. We, we, we were on the way to ending this thing and we understand God has given us a new beginning and a fresh start. So... Um, there was a, a strong wind blowing of God's presence and lots of very, very important decisions were made. Uh, so uh, I, I told you I wasn't going to embarrass you if you made decisions last week. I wasn't going to reach out. Um, that, that was kind of up to you. Some of you responded with emails to me this week. But what, what I have up here on the table, if, if you are one of those who made a decision last week, and you kind of want, what, what do I do for a next step? If you don't want to call us, all right, or send me an email, because we'll help, we'll be happy to do that, but only at your invitation, all right? But you would like to take something with you away today. And so, please know, if you didn't make a decision last week, don't come and take one of these. I didn't buy enough for everybody, all right? Uh, but, but these are, particularly if you were a first-time decision or this is about uh, saving your marriage, I'd like you to come up and, and find something that is appropriate for you because not all the decisions were the same. Um, if, if you are a brand new Christian, you've been away a long time, I'd hardly recommend this book. It's called Classic Christianity. It, it's slightly outdated, though they're still printing it, but it was written about uh, 25, 27, oh no, I gotta lie, uh, it's about 30 years ago. Um, it's one of my favorite books on what a relationship with God is all about, what it means to be a Christian and trust in Christ in your life. Uh, if we run out, Majesty's got plenty of them. You can go pick one up, all right? But it's called Classic Christianity. Uh, I've got two or three different books up here that are like this. These are Bible studies. You want to you wanna open your Bible and you want to look at uh, how do I find my way through the Bible. There's a couple of these up here that you can do that with. It's on decisions, Christian disciplines, Christian character. Um, two, two different books on hope. All right, what our hope in Christ is all about. All right, and so you can you can pick these up. These are just some things uh, for those who made decisions. If you're just wanting to take a next step, I don't want to leave you dangling out there with nothing. Um, so you can come up here and pick up a book after the service. Um, and, and or you can reach out, send an email to me, send one to Mark, just send one to the office and uh, we will connect you with somebody who will, who will help you with those next steps and whatever it is that you are facing. All right, but thank you for being back today. We're happy to have you here. Let me take care of a few announcements and then some prayer requests. Um, the board over there, those are our, 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 and when we say junior high, I hope you understand, uh, junior high is not the same in Africa as it is here. That really is their high school program. It's more than just uh, two years like our middle school program is. Uh, these are kids from a backwood village in Ivory Coast, Africa, in a place called Neonan. Um, that was a miraculous class. Normally, only 10% of the kids who take the sixth grade test pass and are allowed to go on to junior high. Uh, Madame Elise had 
had all of her kids pass that test that year. So there are 39 students that we have been sponsoring for the last two years. This will be the beginning of year three. Um, Madame Elise feeds these kids every single day. We, we have built a dormitory so they can stay right near where she is because if they went back to their homes, their fathers would send their sons to the field for slave labor and would sell their daughters in marriage for a little bit of money. And so they stay there with her in the dormitory we built. So what it costs to feed, to clothe, to buy their books, and to keep their bicycles running because they travel 28 miles a day our kids complain if they have to walk more than six blocks. These kids ride a bike or walk 28 miles a day to get their education. And they are excited to do it. And we can sponsor a child for $585. So if you would like to sponsor a child for an entire year, you want your small group to do it, uh, you want your expanded family to do it, uh, please come up afterwards. Look for a child that doesn't have a smiley face on it. Smiley face means they already have a sponsor. So come up and find a child that doesn't. Write your name and contact information. The office will contact you or you can write a check for $585. Make it to New Hope. Put it in an envelope. Write on it. Neon and children and then the office will contact you about the name of the child that you are sponsoring. Uh, I will tell you this because sometimes people ask, you will not get, they live in the bush. So I want to make this clear, there are not telephones. On rare occasions you'll find uh, a chief might have a cell phone which blows me away when you walk into a village and he walks out of a hut with a cell phone to his ear. That's a little peculiar, all right? Uh, but they are in the bush. They, are, they, they, they live off of a path, not a road. Uh, they don't have access to internet, though we have iPads there for educational purposes. In the library we built last year, there is no internet service or connection there yet, all right? So communication is slow. A few of these kids... Uh, some of them have dropped out and some others have taken their place. And so sometimes you'll see a new kid with a new name which is on there. Um, we do our best when we go back in February to get them to write a letter so that we can bring back to you. Uh, but we're, we do this not for what we get back. We do this for what we can give to them. And um, three years ago, one of those children scored the second highest in the country on the entrance exam to high school last year and the year before last year and this year they've had the highest score in the national exam and this past year they've taken one of those students out of the the educational program there in Doropo took them to the capital city and they are now part of a special science and technology program that's limited to just 50 kids in the whole country and so her kids are doing very, very well, and that is the hope of their future and the nation's future. So, if you'd like to participate in it, come up afterwards. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask us. Uh, do we have any of our quilt ladies in here? Any of the ladies who work uh, in our quilting program here? Stand up real quick. All right, stand up. You do that. All right. Uh, I hope you all noticed the little candy dish, all right, which is in here. That was a gift that was sent to all of you from a lady who was battling cancer in the hospital and a quilt was delivered to her from New Hope Church and she said it made her day and her stay so much better that knowing strangers cared about her. And so she brought a thank you gift, and we wanted to share that publicly with everybody. Be praying for all of our kids, uh, I think from elementary all the way through high school, see you at the poll, will be taking place on Wednesday of this week. So pray for them as they pray for their schools this coming Wednesday. Uh, you could get tickets for our Harvest of Blessing Banquet, which is our 25th anniversary uh, banquet that will be the end of October. Those tickets are available out in the pavilion after the service. Please take time to read our volunteer volunteer recognition story, all right, of Teddy and Christy Miller, who just happened to be in this service. Would you two stand, please? I know you love doing this. Would you two please stand? Those two serve in so many, many capacities, we didn't even get them all listed in here, all right? And um, they are just absolutely wonderful. Every time I look at them, my heart leaps. Uh, I had the privilege of marrying them, and uh, they came for a few, I'm, I'm going to tell this story because this might fit a few of you. They came for uh, a few years, they sat just about the same place where they're sitting now, except Barry wasn't in the way, and... and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and it, oh, 
It wasn't until one day I asked them specifically to help serve on a committee for me in planning our Make a Difference campaign, the very first one that we did. And I, I always thought they were both so very quiet and, and wallflowers, all right? And then all of a sudden I found out, man, they are gung-ho and uh, they have plugged in ever since then in so many ways and we are so thrilled to have them as part of our New Hope family, our church board, our finance team, our youth department, our all-around volunteers for just about anything that goes on. So thank you for the way in which you serve this church. Um, Sign-up sheets going around. There's just two things on this sign-up clipboard. Uh, one is man camp. If you've already signed up, you do not need to sign up again, but if you haven't, please do. And the, the big item on there, first time this week, is choir, Christmas choir. Christmas is less than three months away, or right at three months away right now. So if you can sing, we would love to have you in the Christmas choir. Uh, it's going to be an exceptional Christmas Sunday this year. I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, and, and you know what? I might, I might have you guys do a rehearsal in the driveway of our house one evening. <laughs> Our house, the new house that we just moved to last weekend is in Candy Cane Christmas Island area, all right? So uh, we're, we're going to push new hope and Jesus a lot with all of our decorations. So we, we might have to have either the worship team or somebody come sing one night. That would be really awesome. Hand out invitations to the Christmas uh, musical Sunday. Also, please note the uh, Christmas musical for our kids. If you are parents and have kids, we would love to have them in the uh, Christmas children's musical as well. Let me wrap up with just a couple of announcements here today. Uh, Bob Klein, Kim Klein, who has sung in our worship team for, uh, off and on for several years. Uh, her dad has just been diagnosed this week with a rare form of liver cancer. It is very aggressive. It is already at stage four. There is not a cure for the type of cancer that he has. There is a treatment that can extend quality of life, uh, but it's a, it's a time frame of one to five years. And so uh, he is a former Fresno police officer, now retired, good friends with Gil Hernandez. Gil has been following up with him this week. Would appreciate you praying for the Klein family. Thank you for your prayers for uh, Ernie Phillips. His memorial service was this past week. Uh, thank you for praying for his family and uh, also his church because he was part of our church family. So thank you for that. And then Paul Williams. Uh, Paul and his wife Claudette attended church for about three years. And then his COPD and lung cancer got too advanced that he really could not leave his home. Uh, Paul Williams was a very special guy to me for a lot of years. Uh, when I was between 14 and 15 years of age, I started going to the Headhunter Barbershop at Cedar Lanes, all right? And Paul started cutting my hair. He cut my hair until I was 55 years old. So he was my barber for 40 plus years. Uh, and just a wonderful gentleman. And he gave his life to Christ uh, after he started coming to New Hope. And um, he went home to be with the Lord this past week. Uh, his service will be after I get back from vacation uh, that following week. So just be in prayer for his wife, Claudette. Uh, Shell and I are leaving uh, on vacation tomorrow. Uh, this is a bucket lip trip for us. We're going to Washington, D.C. and New York City. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. I don't, I don't know if that's worthy of applause, but thank you. Anyway, yeah. Uh, maybe you're applauding that I'm getting out of town, all right? You know, I'm leaving town, all right? Um, most excited about seeing a couple of things. The Museum of the Bible, which is new in Washington, D.C. I'll bring a little report back on that one. Um, in, in, in New York City, I have three things I want to do. I want to go to Ground Zero. I want a really good pastrami sandwich. <laughs> and I want to go to a Yankees game. All right? So those are my three bucket list trips uh, for New York City. And I want no humidity. Okay? So... Uh, that's, that's, that's what I'm looking for. So, uh, anyway, uh, Mark will be preaching in charge of things while I'm gone. So Mark will be preaching next Sunday. Do not stay away. Come and you, you, the church family is still here even when I'm gone. All right. So don't think, Whoa, we get a free Sunday. No, <laughs> because you don't come here because you love me. You come here because you love God. All right. And God will still be here next Sunday. And who knows what he may want to do next Sunday, all right? So uh, trust that you'll come and be a vital part of that. If you are contemplating going to Africa in February, some of you talked about that two weeks ago. If you are contemplating going, that decision needs to be made this week. And so I'm going to have a brief meeting after the 
after the 1045 service. So at 1215, over in the office, uh, if you have an interest in going uh, to Africa on the trip in February, uh, you need to be, if all possible, at that meeting, or you need to call me later today so that we can get some material in your hands because those applications need to be in. The process has to get started immediately, okay? I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering, and then we'll get engaged in our worship today. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your sufficiency in our lives this past week. Thank you for how you have been at work in the hearts of so many. Thank you, Father, for um, that most unique and very special time that many of us got to share last week. Thank you that there, was, um, there seemed to be no human hindrance in your activity and presence. And Father, I pray that um, we'll give you that same kind of freedom today. We, we don't need to see the same outcomes that we experienced last week. But Father, we will we'll be better off by giving you full freedom in our lives and in our worship and in our fellowship. Uh, thank you for how you have prepared to minister to us through the worship team today. And um, may we not just enjoy the beat of the music, but we may also be captured by the message of the words as we lift our hearts and our voices to you in praise and adoration for who you are. We thank you that you are the God of all comfort, so when there is um, the loss of someone's presence and we feel that loss, that you also come to fill that void with your comfort. You tell us there is no grief so deep or so bad, but what your comfort isn't better still. For those who are facing big challenges because of, of health concerns, thank you that we can trust you with those needs. Thank you for those who are facing relationship crises, Lord. You're big enough for all of these. May there be a real sense of surrender of, of our ways to your will. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, Father, we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And before anybody moves, tonight, 6 o'clock, bridge building, Sunday evening worship. We started it two weeks ago, every Sunday night, 6 o'clock, over in the bridge, very casual. We have a wonderful uh, uh, young adult worship team that leads us uh, every week. Um, Ms. Claiborne, Morgan Claiborne, leads our worship on Sunday night. She just did our 8 o'clock service. She does a great job. Uh, I believe Mark is preaching tonight. Uh, so you want to come, meet some people maybe you didn't know were part of uh, New Hope Church because <laughs> you go to a different service than they do. Come and hang out with us tonight from 6 to about 7.10. I invite you to take your Bibles and find the book of Haggai. Today we're going to preach the sermon we planned to preach last week. So turn to the book of Haggai. If you don't know where Haggai is, it's between the two Z brothers in the Old Testament. It's between Zephaniah and Zechariah. Um, if that doesn't help you any, it's between Psalms and Matthew, all right? Uh, so somewhere in between there. I'll give you a couple of moments to find it. Uh, I, I will tell you in the 8 o'clock service today, as I sort of recapped what had transpired in the other two services the previous week, shared a passage of scripture out of the book of Acts in, in terms of uh, what God does for refreshing to his church. Um, we provided this morning an opportunity for those in 8 o'clock service to pray either one of those three prayers that folks may have prayed the previous week at these services. Uh, there was a young man, I'm going to say he's probably around 30, maybe 32 years of age, who came for the very first time. He was a guest of Fred. Fred's one of our Harley Davidson riders in the 8 o'clock service. And uh, I'm not sure where Fred picked up this young man. Uh, this young, came, young man came to me after the service out here in the pavilion and, 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 and said, Pastor, I need to tell you something. Uh, today was for me. He said, I invited Christ in my life this morning. He said, I've been incarcerated six or seven times in my life. Um, I, was, I was looking for you and Fred to introduce him to somebody else, all right, uh, who had been where he's been before. Um, and, and he said, I think this is, uh, I'm so glad that Fred found me. This is a fresh start 
uh, in my life. Um, we had a few other folks who were first timers. We, uh, the last two weeks, we've had more first timers in eight o'clock service than I've ever seen. Uh, we had one whole table last Sunday. And why do people choose eight o'clock for the first time to come to church? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, it was awesome. And uh, we had some other first timers there today who uh, one of them raised their hands during the time of prayer that we did at the end. So um, it, was, it, it was a good morning already. The book of Haggai. We'll, we'll be reading from there in just a few moments. There was a time, and some of you might remember this, it's only been a decade or so ago, when motivational posters were really popular. Do you remember seeing them up in the workplace and at the schools? And yeah, yeah. And, and I think you know what I mean. These were posters that, that had a beautiful photograph with an inspirational saying at the bottom of them. Some of you probably hung them up in your own workplace. Well, there was a company towards the end of that uh, popular theme uh, that decided to put out some demotivational posters. They wanted to do the flip side. Uh, let me share a few of those posters that I came across when I googled them. Here's one. Big letters. Mistakes. It could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. <laughs> Wow, that would demotivationalize you, wouldn't it? All right. Here's another one. Doubt. In the battle between you and the world, bet on the world. <laughs> Humiliation. Ooh, I've been there. The harder you try, the dumber you look. <laughs> Losing. Big letters. Losing. If at first you don't succeed... It could be that losing is your style. <laughs> Despair. It's always darkest just before pitch dark. <laughs> we laugh at those because all of us know what discouragement looks like and unfortunately we all know what discouragement feels like. The truth be told, we spent more time discouraged in our life than we ever wanted. So these demotivational posters remind us how challenging optimism can be. Today we're going to talk about how we stay focused on God's priorities and promises when discouragement invades our world. There was a song that my dad started singing a lot more often after my mother turned 40. I'm not sure it was the wisest thing he ever did. But on her 40th birthday, dad sang, the old gray mare, she ain't what she used to be, <laughs> ain't what she used to be, ain't what, yeah, the old, yeah, you, you all know the song, right? Many long years ago. Well, that song might aptly be applied to the culture of our world today. Our world ain't what she used to be. Some of the recent rulings by the Supreme Court, some of the crimes and the actions that we see on the daily news. Um, one of the more um, interesting, frustrating, and I guess we could say confusing radio talk shows I've heard in a long time was just aired a week before last. And that is the uh, current contemplation of our state government in adding a third option on our driver's license, which is binary. And that led into the discussion that there are some parents now in our state who are choosing not to put on children's birth certificate, male or female, but we will wait till they decide sometime in the future. You see, the church in the United States seems to be losing its luster of God's glory. Statistically across this country, attendance is less. We may have more bigger churches. We have fewer believers going to church. Commitment seems to be waning. Those who are going to church are going to church far less than they once did. It's not that going to church more often makes us better believers. But somewhere I have to think there is some consistency that does come out of that, that we have lost. Um, many of God's people are looking wistfully back 
hoping for a return of glory of something they once experienced, but hope is fading. It could appear to the outside observer that that old song is true, the old gal, this old nation just ain't what she used to be. And possibly what we're, we could be experiencing in this 21st century is exactly what the Israelites were feeling at the time that Haggai wrote this. Close to 3,000 years ago. You see, the Israelites had returned from captivity to find their city and their temple in ruins. Remember our study of Habakkuk earlier this summer? That was before the Babylonians came in, wiped, them, wiped out their city, and took them into captivity. This is now... 70 year plus years later, the city and the walls and the temple have been laying in ruins for 70 plus years. Now some of the people had come back. They were beginning to rebuild. They rebuilt what they thought they could. But they became discouraged in their rebuilding process because they felt like they weren't worthy enough. And now... Their motivation was at an all-time low because they knew they never could restore the temple to its previous glory, or so they thought. But God's going to give them some insight, and that's where chapter 2 of the book of Haggai comes in. Let's begin reading at verse 1. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Just as a side note, back up to chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord. Now we're on the 21st day of the seventh month. So we're about a month later. Okay? About a month later. The word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shelatiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, and the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, and ask them, Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? The simpler, a simpler question would be, How many of you are old? Okay, because you were going to have to be well over 70 to have remembered this, all right? Memory may, I mean, okay, maybe at five or six you'd remember, but let's say 10. Most of these folks who would remember the glory of the temple would have to be over 80 years of age. How many of you are here that remembers? Does it not seem like nothing now? But be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua. Be strong, all the people of the land, declares the Lord, for I am with you declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I coveted with you when you came out of Egypt. You have more now than my people did when I brought them out of Egypt. What I did for them then, I can do for you now. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house. And that's what the sermon two weeks from now is going to be all about. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace. Hmm. There was an old farmer who was about to die. And he called his two sons to his bedside and he said, Boys, my farm and all the fields are yours. You each have equal shares. I leave you a little ready cash, but the bulk of my wealth is hidden somewhere underground on the farm. I'm not sure anymore quite where I put it. But, but it's not more than about 18 inches from the surface. In time, of course, the old man died. And the sons inherited a farm. Not long afterwards, they set to work digging up every inch of the ground. But they failed to find any treasure. But since they had gone to all the trouble of turning the soil, and since it was springtime, they thought they might as well plant a crop, which they did. And in the fall, they reaped a good harvest. The following autumn, as soon as they had opportunity, they dug for the treasure again, but with no better results. As the fields had been turned over, heading into spring, they thought, well, we might as well plant again, and they reaped an even better crop. Year after year, their search continued for this treasure their dad had left. Year after year, they gained a good crop. It was only after the boys had grown much older and a little wiser that they realized 
what their father had done. He taught them, we reap what we sow. And God says so. The Bible talks a lot about that concept of faith. And he uses that very same example multiple times in the scripture. The farmer sows seeds in a way they exercise faith. A faith that which he has sown will one day yield a crop. But the farmer will only get a crop if he works the ground and he plants the seed. It's the farmer's faithfulness to this concept that gives him success as a farmer. And I suggest to you, we reap what we sow. I'm getting, I'm getting this spooky little echo here. And we will only reap what we sow in our life in the disciplines of faith, of being in the Scripture and in the Word and daily having conversations with him. Now, now this whole concept of reaping and sowing is a good theory. But as I heard a, a, one of my professors in college say, I never studied theory. Life is often about cold, hard facts. And faith can be a hard thing to hang on to when life gets really, really tough for us. Our passage this morning comes from the book written by the prophet named Haggai. And Haggai is talking to a very discouraged nation. Seventy years before the Jewish nation had been dragged into exile because of their sin and their disobedience, they had backslidden from God. God caused a mighty nation to come down and carry Judah into captivity, and they destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. It's now 70 plus years later, in accordance with the prophecy of Daniel, they have now returned home. But their homecoming is bittersweet. They return to a city that still lies in ruins and the temple is in shambles. And now it's their job to rebuild and to restore what has been destroyed. Isn't that a discouraging place to be? When you've let your marriage get so bad that it has to be rebuilt and restored. When you allow your church, like in Coway, to just become invisible that it needs to be rebuilt and restored. So they set to work and they began to rebuild the, the, the walls around the city for their protection. They began to rebuild the temple for their spiritual nourishment. But, but there was a small problem. They weren't wealthy enough to rebuild a temple that would equal the old one. And they knew it. The one that had been destroyed was Solomon's temple. The one that his father David had dreamed about building and left a, a large cache of money for his son to use to build it. And then Solomon taxed the people even more so that it could be the greatest of its kind. It had taken, listen to this, it had taken 183,000 laborers, construction workers, seven years to build Solomon's temple. It was built using all those resources I just mentioned. And then King Solomon imposed heavy taxes during his reign to keep the construction up. He taxed the people so heavily that this burden served as one of the causes of the split of Israel into two nations after Solomon died. If I've done my math right, and I used a calculator to do it, it seems that Solomon's temple was constructed using over 663 pounds of silver, somewhere around 567,000 pounds of gold. That's not to mention all the other precious stones and expensive wood and other materials used for the construction. Now, this morning, bright and early, so it would be current, I googled what the current price of silver is. It's $17.22 an ounce. You multiply that by 16 to get a pound, and you multiply that by 683,000 pounds. The silver that invested in that first temple was $182,325,000. Now, you've got to remember, this is B.C. Now, I haven't got to the gold yet. Current price of gold today is $1,299.82 an ounce. I wished I had my weight in gold right now. Actually, I wished I was a little heavier right now and had my weight in gold. 
You multiply that times 567 by 16 and then by 567,000, that gives you 1,179,136,000. One That's just in the gold and silver and nothing else in that temple. And now you are to rebuild after you've been in captivity for 70 years? Might you be discouraged? I don't care who you are. That's a lot of money to be wrapped up in a single building. The Jews who returned from exile weren't nearly as wealthy as those who built the first temple. They couldn't invest that kind of money and resources. And so the temple they have managed to build was extremely inferior compared to Solomon's. It was functional, but it was nowhere near as extravagant. Ezra tells us, the prophet Ezra, that when some of the Jews stood before what they had built, they were discouraged, and here's what they said in Ezra 3.12. Many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of the temple being laid. They were frustrated, they were despondent, and I think they might have even been a little embarrassed. But what I find interesting is how God responded to the discouragement of the people. In verse 4, he says, But now be strong, O Zerubbabel. Be strong, O Joshua. Be strong, all of you people. And then he gives them why they can be strong. For I am with you. Did you notice that God repeats himself three times? Be strong, be strong, be strong. Actually four times. And then he says, be strong and work. Notice he says, be strong. He didn't say, get strong. This was not about them exercising and getting help. This was about them trusting God for his strength. And he says, I am, be strong. Why? Because I am with you. The Lord God Almighty is with you. Be strong in his strength. Because they had taken a good hard look at the temple they built. And it so frustrated them that they literally put down their tools and stopped working on the temple and they went back to their own homes and built beautiful personal houses because they could do that. But they couldn't build a temple that compared to the previous. At their heart was frustration, fear, and embarrassment. They were afraid that God didn't love them anymore and wasn't going to be with them anymore because what they built was not as nice as what others had built. And so God reminds them, my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. They're afraid and embarrassed because they didn't have enough money. So God tells them, don't worry about the money. He said in verse 8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. <laughs> don't you and I often think it's ours? God says, no. I can take it from you as quickly as you earned it. Remember in the first chapter, you, you're taking it in, but, but, but it's like your, your pockets have holes in it. It goes out as quickly as it comes in. It's until you understand the principle that it's all mine. Don't, don't worry. What I provided for Solomon then, that was my doing. What I'll provide for you today, that's my doing. Don't sweat that stuff. They were afraid because they didn't think God would bless them as he has in the past. And so God lets them in on a secret. I'm not finished blessing my people. I will shake all nations and I will fill this house with glory. It's not the structure. It's the presence of God that makes a difference in God's house. God is telling his people, don't be deceived by appearances. Don't let the reality you're looking at right now affect your obedience to me. You see, the Israelites were afraid because they looked around and they saw things that were real. They saw realities that made them uncomfortable and they began to falter in their faith. The Israelites of Haggai's day were in danger of becoming like Peter would be when he walked on the water to meet Jesus. Do you remember that story in Matthew 14? It was a dark, stormy night. The disciples were out on a boat. Jesus had been praying up on the beach. A storm comes up and they get grown fishermen afraid in a boat. And they're terrified. And then Jesus comes walking across on the water. And now they end up more terrified. And Jesus said, hey, don't be afraid. It's me. It's me, I've, I've, I've come to you. And, and Peter gets all excited about seeing Jesus right there. And he said, hey, hey, if that's really you, he sounds a little bit like the thief on the cross, doesn't he? 
Remember the thief on the cross who said, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, get us down from the cross. Peter says in the boat, hey, if that's really you out there on the water, then let me come walk to you. And Jesus said, come on. And you and I may be critical of Peter. He happens to be my hero in this moment. He's the only one of the 12 disciples who got out of the boat. All the rest of them stayed in. Pete gets out. He walks on the water. He's heading towards Jesus. This is all so cool. And then, what, then he makes a, a mistake. And this mistake is fatal always to our faith. What does he do? He stops looking at Jesus. And he looks at the realities around him. Because the realities hadn't changed yet. There was still a, there was still a sea. There was still a boat. There were still storm clouds. There were still big waves. And Peter all of a sudden stopped looking at Jesus and he looked at the realities around him and he began to sink like a rock. And then he cried out, Lord, help me. And Jesus reached out and he helped him. Psychologist Dr. Carl Minninger once observed, attitudes are more important than facts. The Bible supplies us with a host of people who rose above their circumstances because of their attitudes of faith. The faith they possessed in God's power was so strong that they pressed on to victory despite what they saw and what they experienced. God is still able to do that for you and for me today if we will let him. Let me give you a few examples. Do you remember that Moses led Israel out of Egypt with a stick in his hand? It was the rod of God that convinced Pharaoh to let the people go. David killed a giant with what? A sling and a stone. He was just a boy. And he defeated a military giant with a sling and a stone. Gideon and 300 men attacked and put to flight an army of 135,000 soldiers. And they did it with just trumpets and torches as their only weapon. Jesus fed 5,000 men plus women and children, with five loaves of bread and two fish. And then what did Jesus have the disciples do after 5,000 plus ate till they were full? What did he have them do? He had them pick up leftovers. How many, how many baskets of leftovers were there? How many disciples were there? Do you think there might have been a reason? One for each disciple to remind them, don't look at the problem, look at your Savior. That's the way we are to live. Those things shouldn't have happened. Those weren't normal results. They defied reality, they defied the facts, but they did them anyway. Why? Because facts are not always What's most important, but attitudes motivated by the truth of who God is, is absolutely important. Paul was of the opinion that he could do all things through Christ, who was his strength. He wrote that in Philippians 4.13 from a prison cell. Essentially, that's what God is telling the Israelites of Haggai's day. Don't give up. Don't let reality damage your faith. Don't let what you see in this world cause you to take your eyes off of what God can do. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. Or Corinthians 5.7 tells us, We live by faith, not by sight. Like the farmer, if we're going to reap the crop of God's blessing, then we must plant the seeds of faith in our circumstances, in our relationships, and in our daily lives. Bill Bright, that's a name that I'm afraid too many people are forgetting. Bill Bright was the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. Bill Bright is now in heaven. Bill Bright told about talking to a man about sharing his faith with others. Oh, I almost forgot a key line here. One man once observed that sheep do one thing extremely well. You know what that is? They make other sheep. <laughs> sheep are good at that. I want to suggest to you 
that if you and I learn to live more by faith than we do by what we see, as the sheep who are part of God's pasture, we'll get good at making more sheep. It's what we've been called to do as his church. We got a taste of it last Sunday. Wasn't that exciting? Wouldn't it be great to have that kind of excitement a little more than every blue moon? Amen. Yeah. So, that being said, Bill Bright talked about talking to a man about sharing his faith. And the man replied, I don't wear my religion on my sleeve. My religion is personal. I don't want to talk about it. May I pause there just to say that's the difference between religion and a relationship. If all you are is religious, then don't wear it on your sleeve. <laughs> don't tell anybody about it. But if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that's personal. You need to tell folks about it. The man who made that statement to Bill Bright was one of America's leading statesmen, politician. He was a professing Christian with whom Bill Bright was visiting just off the campus of Harvard University where they were both guest speakers. Bright had just asked him to become involved with a thousand key Christian leaders in a great worldwide effort to help fulfill the Great Commission. Bright said, this man's statement startled me. I don't wear it on my sleeve. It's private and it's personal. So I asked him, you are a Christian, aren't you? He said, yes, I am, but I'm not a religious fanatic. So Bright prodded the man. He said, did it ever occur to you that it cost Jesus Christ his life so that you could call yourself a Christian? It cost the disciples their lives and millions of Christians throughout the centuries have suffered and died as martyrs in order to get the message of God's love and forgiveness to you. Now, do you really believe that your faith in Christ is personal and private and shouldn't be talked about? As quick as a flash, this man replied, No, Sir Bill, I was wrong. Sign me up. Tell me what I can do about it. How personal is your faith in Jesus Christ? How real is your faith? In Jesus Christ. Is it not worth telling your family and your friends and others that God puts in your way? I'm not asking you to go to Africa. I'm asking you to tell your family, to tell your best friend, to tell those God provides you opportunity with, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm not asking you to debate religion with them. Tell him you're in love with Jesus and the difference that he makes in you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we get sometimes so discouraged because our house isn't as nice as somebody else's house. Our clothes are not as nice as somebody else's clothes. Our church is not as big as somebody else's church. And God, you have taken the small things of this world and you have confounded the wise and the powerful. You took uneducated fishermen and you turned the world upside down. You can take folks just like us in this room and you can use us to be a spark for refreshment and revival and renewal in this community. I pray that we will let you do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Just before you go, since I ended right on time today. <laughs> several people have asked me, Tim, you're wearing a tie and a coat today. There are two reasons for that. One, that it's considerably cooler today. That was not enough to convince me last night, though, before I went to bed to set it out. What convinced me was this. Tim, you're leaving on vacation on Monday. What if you die on your trip and they never see you again? <laughs> the last time they see you, they can say they saw you in a coat and tie. So God bless you. Have a great day.